Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Trainer, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this class of Lawyers as Leaders. Um, at a time in which everyone is very aware and very focused on the upcoming presidential election, uh, we're very fortunate to have as our guest speaker uh, a faculty member who has been really so critically important uh, in national politics and in elections um, since the 1960s. So uh, thank you very much, Professor Edelman, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you, Dean. Um, so before we uh, begin to talk to Professor Edelman, uh, a few housekeeping matters. Um, our next and final session is two weeks from today on November 15th, and we won't be meeting next week. Um, your TAs will be posting a one-page memo with information on the final paper requirements. So please read it carefully and adhere to the guidelines. A um, couple, couple things, good lawyers meet deadlines. And in fact, in some circumstances, the failure to meet a deadline can be malpractice. Here, it can impact your ability to pass the course. So please be in touch with your TA directly if you have any questions or concerns about the final reflection paper. Um, and let me just talk, say a few words about the, the reflection paper. Uh, the course is, is now drawing to a close. Uh, we have two more sessions. And the reaction paper is an opportunity for you to reflect on what you've read and heard and what you've learned. And for me, the course has two large topics. First, it's about leadership. Um, Georgetown Law is fortunate to have a faculty that has many people who made important changes or contributed in important ways to how we think about the great issues of our day. Uh, I've selected eight faculty members, but I could have selected any, any of a number of people from our faculty. Um, as you reflect on these sessions and the readings, what are your thoughts on how to lead and on how to make change? Uh, you've heard about successes and how they've been achieved. You've also heard about failures in moving forward. Uh, and that's also a part of leadership. So many of our sessions have involved conversations about losses. I'll be talking to Professor Edelman later about Professor or President Clinton signing the welfare reform bill. Professor Barnett spoke of the Sibelius decision. Professor Nurse of the decision in Morrison. Professor Katyal of the decision in the travel ban case. Each was a loss. So when you're thinking about leadership, I want you to think about how do you move forward? And also how do you move forward when you confront defeat and loss? So in addition to giving you an opportunity to reflect on leadership, the second goal of the course for me is to give you an opportunity to reflect on the choices you'll make. You know, it's particularly important as you're starting your legal careers to think about what you want to achieve and I've asked each of our speakers to talk about how their experiences shaped their choices about what they would do with their careers. And I have to say, I've been moved by their answers and by how candid people have been. And I hope in the reflection paper, you'll reflect on what you've learned and on what insights it might offer as you think about your choices. So uh, I look forward to seeing your papers and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, I'd like to recognize first uh, Celia Colano and Carolyn Corcoran, the TAs who've helped organize today's session and did a wonderful job and a fabulous, fabulous work. Uh, and I want to thank again, Dean Sale, who helped me think through uh, you know, the, the questions and the organizations of today's class. Uh, now introducing our guest, uh, Professor Edelman is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy, and he's the faculty director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. Uh, he's worn many hats over the years. He's been Associate Dean of the Law Center, Director of the New York State Division for Youth, Vice President of the University of Massachusetts. He was a legislative assistant to Senator Robert Kennedy and was issued director for Senator Edward Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1980. He attended Harvard College and Law School. He clerked for first Judge Henry Friendly on the Second Circuit and then Justice Goldberg on the United States Supreme Court. He then worked in the US Department of Justice as special assistant to Assistant Attorney General John Douglas. Um, as I said, he worked in state government uh, in New York and then at the University of Massachusetts. And he was in a, and President Clinton's first term, he was counselor 
to HHS Secretary Donna Shalala and then Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. He wrote, Searching for America, Searching for America's Heart, RFK and the Renewal of Hope. And that was, we read from that today. Uh, his most recent book uh, is So Rich, So Poor, Why It's So Hard to End Poverty in America, which was published in 2012. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you know, it's really, uh, again, it would be uh, a privilege to have you at any, any moment, but in, in this moment when we're thinking so much about what the path of our nation will be. It's, it's particularly terrific to have you here and to have you reflect both on your career and on two moments from that career, you know, working for Senator Kennedy uh, and your experience in the Clinton administration. So, so welcome and thank you. Well, thank you, Dean. I'm just so pleased to be here today. Um, of course, it's a time when I wonder whether anybody's paying any attention to anything except the uh, elections coming on Tuesday. Uh, so uh, I, uh, if somebody uh, doesn't notice what I say, it's perfectly okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, th this is a, just a hugely important time that we're going through. Well, and you know, I think you have um, given so much thought for so many years about the path that the nation should follow, and and again, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, focusing in part, among other things, on kind of two critical moments um, on Senator Kennedy's vision. And I have to say, in reading through your book, I was struck at how prescient he was, um, and then on you know, what happened during the first Clinton administration and policies that you very strongly and memorably disagreed with. So it would be uh, appropriate and great to hear from you any time, but this moment in particular, uh, you know, we're really fortunate. So that, that's why I programmed you for this weekend. <laughs> okay, <laughs> accepted. <laughs> so let me start. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me in, in the book was that you weren't originally thinking of a public interest career. Uh, what, what led you down the path of, of thinking of, of, you know, having the kind of change focused career that you've led? I think it was still, it was there from the very beginning. Um, my, my parents uh, in Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, were very much involved in the community. Um, my uh, father was a wonderful lawyer, uh, and he did a lot of pro bono uh, work, uh, civil rights uh, at, the, at the time, uh, discrimination, uh, uh, the, the question of the fire uh, people. Uh, uh, it was entirely white at that time, and, and he did that. And, uh, and I uh, and my wonder, my mother was a wonderful uh, piano player, a pianist, and, and uh, um, it, it came to me a lot later on that what they'd been doing uh, really did relate to what it sort of turns out that I am. Um, uh, so it starts there, it, their commitment. I, I understood down the road that uh, it was around there, uh, even if I sort of wasn't seeing uh, what is in fact the truth there. Um, that said, uh, I, I thought uh, getting out of law school, uh, I thought I would uh, start uh, in, in a law firm. And uh, my idea was my father was a wonderful lawyer, but he was in Minneapolis. And so I was gonna be big time lawyer in, in uh, New York. And, and what happened, uh, those were all very, very important, uh, Judge Friendly, you mentioned. And, uh, but uh, in my mind, other than the back of my brain about my parents, uh, was Arthur Goldberg. Um, and he had been the Secretary of Labor uh, and uh, had, uh, was a very important figure uh, before he went on, the, uh, went, went on the Supreme Court. Um, and what I learned there, and again, it sort of uh, wasn't something that I got the, the first minute of it, but I had gone to Harvard Law School, uh, nice, I guess, um, but, um, in ret retrospect, I uh, now understand that the concept was, a, it was kind of the Justice Frankfurter 
the way we looked at things, which is you could sort of look, uh, this is a little bit not quite, but, but that you could find the uh, answers uh, in, in uh, the existing uh, law books. And uh, it was, uh, there, there wasn't the sense of, frankly, uh, in, in where the justice was uh, in it. Uh, and of course, now I'm at, 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 at Georgetown, so uh, I know every day that law is but the means and justice is the end. Well, that's, that's what I learned from, from Arthur Goldberg. Uh, and it went uh, after a while. He would always ask when we met with the justice uh, uh, before or either uh, what, when there was going to be uh, the having the, the having it out with, out with the judges and the uh, lawyers and so on. But when we were deciding, how, what, how was he going to vote? And he always said, asked to us and to himself, uh, justice. And uh, then he would ask, um, how do we work backwards, if you will, uh, into uh, the result? Uh, always within the possibilities uh, of, of the result, but justice was the point. And after a while, I figured out what he was doing. And um, it, for, at first, uh, with that kind of, uh, the, the idea of the Harvard version, if you will, uh, I realized that was not the same of what I was getting from Arthur Goldberg, and it made it, once I kind of opened up and understood that, that justice is the point, uh, it made a, an enormous difference uh, to me. Now, the, you know, that's the beginning here in me having a different view, and, and we'll talk about more because uh, after uh, working with Justice uh, Goldberg, uh, I then end up with Robert Kennedy, which is sort of the, the next big step. And then, I mean, when he, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you came from, uh, you know, the Harvard model at the time, the legal process model. Yes. Was that there was really, there was one right answer. Yes. Uh, and that was certainly, I mean, there was judge friendly was really kind of a. Yes. Expositor for that. And. Um, and Justice Frankfurter was really that he was the the iconic figure of, of that approach. Um, yes. Now, actually, one of the students has written in and you know challenges that jurisprudential philosophy and says, "Isn't that legislating from the bench?" What made you find this a powerful rather than something to struggle against? Well, um, the question is, what's the what's the line, if you will? Uh, that of is, this is the the uh, Supreme Court. It's not uh, the lower courts. Uh, on the other hand, we have a continuing uh, debate uh, about everything uh, be in uh, original uh, means, uh, and those who uh, look for uh, a living constitution. Uh, and that's really what you're saying, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's the big, and uh, the difficulty for, for us, all of us, uh, is neither one of them is satisfactory uh, to find our answers, uh, because uh, original means uh, actually uh, is a, a useful result in, in a pretty small number of things. I mean, when, when you look at Brown, uh, when you look a whole, a long, long, just, I mean, uh, infinite list of things uh, which cannot be uh, how to, how, what it, how to decide, um, you don't, you don't get it from, from uh, original means. You, you get it from, uh, a lot of times you get it from a, a point of precedent uh, that finally comes something that's uh, settled law. Uh, but of course, uh, the Supreme Court is deciding things all the time uh, where the reason they're there is they have no answer mm -hmm. and they're deciding. Uh, if it was easy, originally me, we, we didn't have to bother to have the judges out, justices out there. You know, you just say, oh, well, it's something that happened in 1799, 88, whatever. Um, 
And so that's the framework uh, of what I, of course, we, we didn't have original means when I got out of law school in 1961 either. If somebody thinks that that's been a way of looking at it, excuse me, it's not right. Uh, it's really in the 70s when we began to have, when we got to have more, more conservative members of the Supreme Court and, and uh, uh, the, the number of people who are on the five uh, many times starting then, uh, we see this two ways of looking at it. Uh, when I thought, uh, I thought we, we went to New Deal. Uh, we had uh, the, the starting with Franklin Roosevelt and then Warren, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. And we thought we're done with it. Um, and uh, we now we know how to do this, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of a constitution that has this living uh, aspect to it, uh, whatever that means. Um, and so we were all happy. Uh, and then it turned out uh, to the point where we are right now, where some of us are really very unhappy. <laughs> so, um, we'll, and we'll be back to that, I hope. Uh, but so, so you clerked for Justice Goldberg, and then how did that lead you to working for uh, Bobby Kennedy? Well, so here's something that uh, a lot of the students know this point, and certainly you and I do. Uh, there's a lot of accidents along the way. And uh, I think that our uh, students, I trust, are thinking uh, about uh, what they want their career to be and, and uh, what steps they should take uh, toward that. But uh, I promise a large, large, large number of the people who are out there uh, with us today uh, better understand and do understand that something's going to happen that they don't know what it is. Uh, and anybody who thinks they can have that pathway, it's all, path, you know, better to think about it uh, and, and see if you have an idea, uh, which I hardly did. Um, but uh, it, it, so it's just very important to understand that changes happen what we do are things that you have no idea are going to happen. And that's me. Uh, because yes, I got to clerk for uh, Judge Friendly and we should, we should put our hats up on, on Judge Friendly um, because he was on the Harvard side, uh, but he was brilliant. And I learned from him about being meticulously careful and uh, to, uh, I learned an enormous amount for, for Henry Friendly. Um, and again, he's second circuit. Uh, but uh, I, it, it happens that I was supposed to clerk for Justice Frankfurter. Uh, and uh, he became ill, a stroke, and, and uh, I ended up with, with Justice uh, Goldberg. Well, there, those are two different ways of looking at, at the law. And it just happens uh, that, I mean, even the fact that I, uh, the, the Frankfurter was more, well, okay, you're in Harvard and uh, uh, Professor H H H H Six, uh, Sachs um, says, okay, you go there to Frank Frankfurter, that's all set up, da, da, da. I was very lucky in that, but that was on a line. Uh, and then uh, Frankfurter, uh, and I, actually the, the, the other thing about Frankfurter, which seems a little odd, but it's true. He always tell people to go home, go mm -hmm. home to your home city. And if I'd done that to Mrs., uh, to back to Minnesota, that'd be different mm -hmm. uh, in a way that you wouldn't think actually. Uh, in any case, Arthur Goldberg uh, comes not only different way of looking at things, but, but on, at that point in time, he didn't say go back to Minnesota. He said, you have to go work in a Department of Justice. And uh, you mentioned John Douglas was a wonderful, wonderful man. His father was a Senator from, from uh, Illinois, as you know. Um, and um, that was totally a direction that I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. uh, now, a lot of young people at that point, once I was in the Supreme Court uh, and, and uh, it was not, Shocking. A lot of us came uh, for for a year or more uh, into DOJ from uh, from uh, the court. 
but that's that's the next big thing here because um I'm in uh, the Department of Justice, and uh, the next thing that's happened is horrible. Uh, it's the fall of uh, 1963, and uh, President uh, Kennedy is murdered. And for the country, that's a little more important than me, um, that Robert Kennedy then needed to have something else to do. But I'm in the Department of Justice and uh, I had actually taken a job with a law firm uh, in, in, uh, in uh, New York and I never showed up. I've always wondered about walking over there and see if they, I still have my name on there. <laughs> Maybe you have a pension. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Well, I, they, I'd have a lot of money by now if we did. Uh, but in any event, um, Kennedy decided to run for uh, uh, senator. Uh, and uh, I always had in my life uh, that I loved uh, politics one way or another, high school, whatever, whatever. Um, I, I, I was governor of uh, the high school uh, uh, statewide uh, legislature. So, I mean, it was something. A little more selfish, maybe, um, and and uh, so uh, I was going to New York anyway. I got hooked up because of John uh, Douglas, and uh, I, he got me into the into the campaign, and that led to uh, going to work for for Robert Kennedy. Well, how come how come any? And we haven't finished this even barely started all the accidents that took place. So good accidents. That, that took place, but that that's how I got to that's how I got to Robert uh, Kennedy was being in that luckily in that point in DOJ uh, at exactly the right time. And then, um, and it's really you know one of the things that actually some of the other speakers have talked about is, you know, that you can't plan it all out. You know that you know that your career takes paths that you couldn't have envisioned. And you have to be attentive to the opportunities that they present themselves as they present themselves. And you know what an extraordinary opportunity to work for Senator Ken or then candidate uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, do you remember the first time you met him? I do. Uh, it was before I, I was a clerk, um, and uh, he came up as a, as Attorney General to, to have lunch with the with the clerks, and I sat next to him. Um, and, uh, so we had a little bit, I mean, if, if you asked him a week later or a day, uh, who that kid was next to me, I don't know that he knew who I was, but that's when I met him. Uh, and the one thing I remember from that is that underneath the table, his hands were, uh, kind of, uh, not, they were, uh, not something, you know, like he was nervous or something. Uh, turns out uh, it's nothing. At the time, I thought, well, gee whiz, all these uh, law firms were, were scaring him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, we went to Harvard and he didn't. Uh, he went to Harvard for undergrad. Uh, um, but yes, that's when I met him. That's Now, let me, we have a lot of questions from the students based on their reading the book about Senator Kennedy. So one is, what were some of the most challenging decisions you watched Senator Kennedy make and how do they inform your understanding of leadership as a young lawyer? He, uh, one thing, he certainly didn't think about leadership. He just did it. Uh, so to, uh, I, uh, he's already remember, he's been attorney general. Uh, and and uh, you know, this is remarkable because he was born in, in 1925 and, and so he's 36 years old, actually uh, not quite 36 years old as the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, and uh, some people who weren't so ex excited about him would say that, uh, but he was remarkable. He was absolutely remarkable. He, he uh, not only uh, ran the department, but he was his brother's brother. And so he was much involved with national security, uh, the whole question of, of Cuba and, and uh, the Adam, 
bombs there. Um, and uh, so his, his uh, it was a kind of an under, he, he there, there was, uh, everything was, a, uh, you just do it. Every day you just do it. Whatever you did yesterday, that's yesterday. Uh, and, and some of things were things that were necessary to do. And so he had to do something. And particularly as, as uh, in DOJ, uh, and uh, other uh, things that he thought of. I mean, one of the things uh, I didn't know him then, um, but uh, he uh, was already interested. Clearly, we know about race because it's civil rights, but uh, also poverty which uh, relates to what finally at, at the end of it, it, it has this enormous effect on me. But in 1961, uh, he cared, uh, he, he's not what he's particularly supposed to be doing something about young people who don't have an opportunity. And uh, he, he puts uh, his, his pal uh, that he, he uh, grew up with, uh, uh, and and uh, he uh, uh, is is uh, sat down next door. David Hackett, uh, right next to Robert Kennedy's office, they they had doors between them, and he brought people. Uh, and David ran it, but people uh, all part uh, the the government, but also from outside and uh, just put all of the, of the uh, background, uh, the, the uh, formation of what turned out to be the, four, the, the war, war on poverty. Um, and uh, the, the, I mean, he had this capacity, uh, very, very smart. And, and, and uh, it was, he had a way of just kind of an instant thing so th there was a point where there was a group meeting and he was going back and forth uh, talking about, uh, uh, this would be in 1962, um, about what we mean is what's gonna be the war on poverty. And down the, road, the, down the hall, he was also in a meeting about the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Cuban, uh, that whole issue about whether there's going, whether whether the whether the, the world is going to be blown up, uh, and it's going back and forth from those two mm. two things. I mean, it just just totally. Uh, I just that that word remarkable. Um, so th this is the this is the. I mean, there's leadership in all of that. Uh, the film uh, from the 13 days uh, showed. I I saw it on television recently. And um, he just, you know, wherever he was, uh, he just, who he is uh, without jumping up and down, uh, he, he just was so thoughtful. Uh, and and um, so he just over and over again, um, he would take, take the lead. Um, he would take the lead to, to uh, take himself uh, in a part of a subcommittee, uh, but things about poverty. You know, here's this man who was his his brother's uh, number two, and everything about Robert Kennedy until he died, till JFK died, it was all whatever uh, JFK needs, RFK does it, uh, and and he didn't have a view about anything except that he was doing. For JFK, uh, and and that's that, that's not a narrow thing. That that's policy and big things. And then he loses that, and he has nothing, and he has to do this on his own. And when when he uh, has a terrible year, I mean, for the rest of his life uh, he did. But but uh, in in the fall and through uh, the large part of 1964, he's just wiped. Uh, and um, 
when he when he comes out of that and he's a senator and he had to practice i mean he had to to run for that and uh, even that process uh, to get himself to be himself and not just tell things about his brother uh and and by the time i get i mean in the in that campaign but uh when he kind of comes back there what's he's interested in well in some ways everything uh the whole world he, he's interested in uh south africa he's interested in in uh things in 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 south america uh in, in but uh there were two major things that happened one of course was the war uh, on vietnam uh and the other was uh, the questions of 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 race and poverty and they certainly connected together and he certainly knew that um, and so when he's Robert Kennedy, as opposed to JFK's brother, this is who he is. Uh, and he just, I mean, I happened to be thrown into that piece of it. He was interested in everything, but, uh, just not because I'm an expert, because I wasn't, um, I learned with him, uh, and, and, uh, it was an amazing thing. But go, I, we went all over the country because he wanted to. He wanted to. He didn't want to read just just books. He read, um, but to go to people who are on the outside, where a senator from that state, whatever it was, had those are places within their own state where a senator had never been, uh, and whether it was a uh, in the city, uh, whether uh, it was in rural. Uh, was it in uh, Na Native American uh, over and over and over and I got to uh, go with him but to watch him because it's this combination of I'm you and I'm listening to you and I'm learning and there's no I'm not going to tell you this I'm not going to do that, do that and just to see that happen and see that he just he grew every day um, because that's how he operated. So uh, and I have to say, you know, the, uh, that's such a moving part of your book when you talk about going to Mississippi and going to see Cesar Chavez. Uh, and that clearly, you know, must have had and, you know, and, and so shocking to, you know, the, you know, kids being malnourished uh, and how that must have affected him. Uh, and then, so actually another question that uh, one of the students asked, so you, you talk about Senator Kennedy as an innate leader with a great capacity for empathy, even though he had never experienced similar struggles to those with whom he greatly empathized, people living in poverty. Do you believe an individual's deep sense of care for an issue comes from firsthand experience, living through poverty, through innate traits, or through secondhand experience, meeting with people, reading, hearing their stories? Yes, and bottom line, um, you can't really say. Uh, the, the, the family, uh, rich, that, that goes one direction. Uh, and on another side, uh, even if we don't think have great uh, belief in the in the father uh, not not our type um but and here is you know the 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 one uh joe who died probably would have been president first joe, joe kennedy uh and then jfk but, but uh and, and teddy's a great senator and i, I just i love the guy but robert kennedy uh is different uh and it is uh there's a lot of people have sort of said why is he different uh, and he's the seventh i think uh and he's sort of buried as he's grown up um and so the theory is it's mine and i think others uh, that he had to deal with his own um uh, uh, not being the one that, that everybody turns to and says you're the brightest and so on and so on he, he was sort of had had to push a little bit to, to get into the deal and and so i think he himself in that situation uh he was uh even though he you don't quite see this he's uh shorter uh than the others 
I mean, not hugely, he's five foot seven or something like that. And he's a great athlete. Um, but so I think some of it, it's in his own family uh, that, that gets him uh, as the person who's connected to the people who are outside, uh, the, the, uh, on the edge or over the edge. Uh, so I think it starts there. He started being friends with pals uh, in, in uh, high school. Um, the, uh, it was a you know, fancy school. Uh, but he found the people uh, th that were not the Richies. Uh, David Hackett, I mentioned, uh, was a great, great uh, athlete. Uh, and he was a townie. He was uh, local. Um, and that was his pal. Um, so it was those kinds of people who were, uh, if you look at his, uh, at his wedding, who was there, uh, he the, the he doesn't want to be uh, an officer uh, in the war. He wants to be just a regular person. Um, so there's something around there that was from the very almost the very beginning uh, of having that uh, want to connect to people who didn't have a fair heart. And then, but then you know from your book and from other things I read, the Mississippi, uh, that going to Mississippi also powerfully influenced him. Is that, is that right? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, I got married because I met the woman of my love uh, on that trip. So I have to say it's the biggest thing that ever happened. But uh, no, I mean, uh, he had been, for example, but it's just an example, of a year before that, we went to see Cesar Chavez and the, the uh, farm union. Uh, and uh, that came because uh, the, the AFL-CIO got in touch with, with us and said that, that, that would Robert Kennedy go with a subcommittee uh, and, and go there. Uh, and in terms of me, uh, which is, he's already been a lot of places in a lot of ways, but uh, that was a, a big thing. I mean, Chavez was so powerful and so important. And, and, and uh, uh, so uh, that's just one example that's, that's a year before that. And we went to Mississippi because there was, a, a, in the subcommittee, they were going all over the country to get to build up support for the war on poverty. There was a lot of political uh, negativity about it. Uh, and the idea was to, to get uh, around the country, partly to listen, partly to see, partly to get them a sense of, of being a part of things, but also to get, because he's Robert Kennedy, uh, he, he could go anywhere in the country and there would be national, uh, Na national ten uh, television that day. So uh, he was deeply in it. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the biggest, but it wasn't the first one at all. Um, now, to so Mississippi itself, why do we go there and, and uh, uh, perhaps not realize that this is part of a big, big pattern? Uh, I mean, we went to, as I said before, Native, Native, Native American places, so-called reservations. Uh, we went to, uh, he was working in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn uh, a, a year before because he went to that place in Brooklyn. Uh, and the, uh, he, we had, uh, Robert Kennedy had given three speeches that I worked on the beginning of 1966 uh, about what we should be doing about uh, inner, inner cities and their problems and connecting that to, the, to the, the whole thing, get people to have a choice to go not be stuck, stuck there. Uh, and he then had gone to Brooklyn uh, one night and, and uh, he said, uh, you know, in effect, what's on your mind? Uh, what do you think? And uh, the people from Brooklyn just get, they, they just threw it at him. They said, what are you doing? Uh, and that turned into this uh, very, very uh, important, interesting Bedford-Stuyvesant uh, uh, multi-activity uh, program. 
Well, this is before Mississippi, uh, and it's in his own state. Uh, and what well, that's that's not those t trips all over the country that I'm that I'm talking about. I mean, going around him, I went to uh, I went to I already said them, but uh, uh, Chicago's another one. I went to see. <laughs> uh senator sent sent me up to see the uh, the famous mayor <laughs> and uh so i had my own uh, little adventures um but let's get to mississippi uh i'm just making the point that he's in it by then in every way all different parts of america as far as that even around the world um so we're going down there uh, because this is in 1967 uh, the, the point of it was about the, the, the war on poverty and there was the largest Head Start program uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, my then to be wife uh, in her various jobs that she had, she was the general counsel to this thing. Tw uh, they had 21 uh, counties uh, and they were this bad politics about it. So then we went down there and when we got down there, uh, Marion said, uh, you know, I, I'm here to tell you about uh, Head Starts and this is what it is and, and these attacks are wrong, but really you have to go to see in America that there are people, especially children uh, in this country who are not getting enough to eat, uh, who are near to, to starvation. And you, Senator, and there were a bunch of other senators. Uh, th there were uh, three or four altogether. Uh, and we went and we saw children who had um, tummies that were uh, out, you know, they were puffed up because of. of odd way but that's the way it is and and, and sores on, on the arms and then and he asked the children did you have breakfast no uh and what's in your ice box or re refrigerator there's nothing in it uh and we go from one next uh to the one house to the next and he says to me that is the worst thing i've ever seen it's like a you know a third fourth kind of uh, uh, country. And then we go into this uh, house where there's a little child who uh, seems to be about two years old and seems to be not be able to get up. And the only people there is Robert Kennedy and Marion and me. Mm. And, and, and uh, he doesn't know that we're seeing Kennedy there. He's trying to get some response from this baby. Uh, and and Marion says, you know, Marion knows all the stories, uh, the, the brother this and the da da da. Uh, particularly in the civil rights uh, thing, wasn't you know there were different views about how well that was done by the, the Kennedys. And 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 Marion said to me, he's the real thing. Hmm. And so he went home and uh, to his uh, and he got, got CBS. Um, and um, Dan Shore, who's our pal until he died, and, and uh, we go walking with his widow wi right now, uh, Lee, Lee, yesterday. Um, and he got home, Robert Kennedy got home, and he said to his kids, and they, they banged their head on, on the dining, dining table. Now, this is a, pub, this is a public interest, to tell you. Uh, uh, but he was so upset. Uh, Every one of you children in this county, you all got to do something good for the public decency, whatever the words he was. Uh, and the next day we went to the, to, to the uh, Secretary of Agriculture, who had also been for JFK and the former Secretary of, Min of Minnesota. And, and uh, he says, Kennedy says uh, to Freeman, you've got to get some, and he's yelling at him, you've got to get some food down there. And the story goes on, and, and we don't have the time for the whole whole thing. But uh, that is uh, that's why you, Bill, have that uh, on the top of the list. Uh, and the result, uh, I will say this: uh, not, not the long, 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 but it's because of Robert Kennedy going to that uh, place and seeing that, and there being national uh, television about it. That's where food stamps comes from. 
Hmm. And the person who, George McGovern did a great time, a great thing from South Dakota and so on, but the person who sent was not Lyndon Johnson who hated Robert Kennedy. It was the next president, Nixon, sends a letter up, up to the, up to the uh, Congress and says, we should have a national food stamp program. Hmm. And a start that comes from that. Hmm. Hmm. And it's an enormous success, as we know. Right. Now, I mean, we were talking before about, you know, what a powerful effect that has. So, um, so two questions that the students have sent in. Um, one is talking about whether uh, Senator Kennedy's vision for, you know, fighting poverty, uh, which I think is, you know, reclaiming America's heart. Uh, is that is that something we can learn from today? Should it be changed? How? I mean, I, I do think it's remarkably prescient, but I, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, there's sort of two answers to that. One is uh, we might say we've never done it correct uh, because if you look at any European country, they, everything is is uh, worked up carefully and you do this and you do that and they all fit together. That's just not us. Um, and so uh, we don't have a system and the consequence of, of this is not something that, that Kennedy was, was really, uh, uh, he knew there was a lot of poverty and what I just said in Mississippi certainly says that there was terrible poverty but uh, it's the lowest people, it's worse now because of what, what Clinton did, and we'll get to that. But uh, the, the, the program, the so-called uh, TANF, the, the so-called uh, reform uh, actually caused uh, worse people at the bottom and that's, that's uh, mothers, that's women and their children. Um, so, uh, Robert Kennedy would be just furious uh, that we've done that uh, in terms of deep, deep poverty. Um, what he would do though, uh, that no one did uh, more broadly was to, to understand that these things all connect to each other. And uh, so that's, I think, the, the, the point is the, when, when I mentioned uh, to Bedford Stuyvesant uh, and, and uh, the, uh, one of your assistants here picked up on that, page 87 in the book, uh, and uh, about a time, which is true, uh, he went, uh, he was, in, he's in, this is in 67, and he's uh, really trying to do things. I mean, this is a, a time uh, when, when uh, the, uh, was a, 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 it's, it's a combination of race and poverty uh, in, in particularly in, in cities. Um, and uh, Kennedy understood that if you wanted to deal in the inner city uh, uh, in, in um, to get to open it up so people could go to other part and not be stuck there segregation but also you that that's been there for such a long time everything is not going well uh, the education is terrible there aren't jobs there uh, the the uh, question of crime is there uh, just uh, housing uh, and he had a, a view <clears throat> that he wasn't by himself, but certainly at that level, uh, he was the one saying, you can't just do one thing. You've got to do all of it. And I think, Bill, that, that's, that's the point here, that he understood that we've never quite, I mean, there are people who understand that it's not just he understood that and not now that nobody does because there are people. Um, but that's, that's, that's the piece uh, you know, we're so, we're, we're having a time uh, uh, on race coming back up to the time, so sad and terrible. Now we didn't, th this is the story in the 60s didn't have a mass incarceration. That doesn't come, uh, it, it starts in the 70s. 
So uh, if we think that it was bad in, in the inner city, uh, it, it actually gets worse because we go uh, around to, to uh, pick up uh, African-American uh, young men and some women uh, and put them in jail by in huge numbers. Uh, and it wasn't even that uh, in that respect, uh, that was, that's gotten worse. Uh, and then the other, this is, we're talking politics here and the way we do, do are doing politics in our country. Cause the other thing then, I mean, that, that's why do they want to do this? Don't kid yourself that, that this, why we're doing mass incarceration uh, is a lot of politics uh, to make sure uh, that we still have the, the racism operative uh, with the political results. Uh, and the other for women was uh, they started then a, a really a war on on welfare starting in in uh, the seventies. Um, so none of that. Robert Kennedy uh, never had a big fight about about incarceration. It certainly wasn't wonderful the way it was, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, it was part of that larger thing. But it's even worse now. So th that's the, the bottom line here on that question is, oh, so uh, page, what was in page eight, 87? The, uh, he goes to uh, a, a uh, the, the, I think it was the New York Times uh, reporters in, uh, in Washington and asked him, what would he do about inner cities? And he said, well, I would have all of uh, the, the mayor city by city with all of the people that, that would be relevant from that community. And they would come to Washington and they would sit in the White House and, and come be made to work on making a plan uh, that cut all of those uh, areas. Uh, and we'll get them, we, uh, the, if I'm president, uh, will get the funding for having that kind of an answer. Uh, now, if you actually to try to do that in exactly the way, I don't know how many cities you'd get done, but the point he was making is that you can't think of this uh, as just one piece or another piece. You have to think of this as a totality. And that's, I mean, what you talk about is really an incredibly ambitious plan that was public transportation and jobs and community economic development and really kind of hit every angle in a yes. very holistic and ambitious yes. way. Yes. Is that yes. something that we could revive today? Well, we should be on, we, uh, um, there's a lot of things to do. The answer is yes. Uh, but, you know, if, if you said, what can, well, the first thing is, can we do things if we're fortunate uh, on Tuesday? And uh, we have a different president and, and uh, people on both the, the, the House and, and the Senate who are all in the same place. Uh, so we would uh, fix the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that has a terrifically good effect and uh, Medicaid uh, for low-income people. Uh, we would raise a minimum wage to 15 per, percent, uh, $15 uh, an hour. Uh, we would have a major uh, effort on child care and child development, which there, there are bills out there that are, that are good. Uh, and uh, we would have uh, people at the lowest income with the child tax credit and the earned income tax cut. My, my, the reason for mentioning uh, those things, and as well as starting to work uh, on mass incarceration and to be much clearer uh, uh, about the race uh, aspect of it. If you do all of those things, you'll be doing some of the things that you just asked me about. And, and you'll have more uh, material to work with uh, in particular areas. Uh, and it's, that's a long-term thing, but that long-term thing definitely has to start the first day um, because it's two things. One, one is to, to have, uh, and we've got all kinds of research on this and, and common sense that we need to have the real possibility of, of uh, 
choice where they live. Uh, and that would be on our list, housing too, affordable uh, housing. Um, and the other thing is some people will stay back in the inner city because they want to. And if you put in the kind of support there and you improve the uh, education and uh, to have uh, uh, to work with the, the uh, what's happening with the police and so on and so on. So it's two things. One is pure choice where people can live. Uh, and the other is uh, building on the inner city in that multiple way. And the first thing you have to do is, is to, uh, th this is what we're gonna do for the next A, B, C, X, Y, Z time to do all those things. That's, comp that's complicated, but you, the best time to start with it and do those basic things that I just said. Uh, and that's what we should do. Now, um... And I think that's very powerful uh, as a, you know, as a path forward. So, you know, and um, reflecting, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, the Bobby Kennedy's vision, you know, when he ran for president. Um, it's striking to me that, you know, I mean, right now we're very divided as a nation. One of the things that's striking to me about Senator Kennedy was he really seems to have been able to bring together a coalition uh, that really kind of transcended the nation, you know, conservatives and liberals and, you know, would he have been able to, if he were elected, would he have been able to hold that together? And again, is that a model now that could be resurrected? Uh, then, of course, the question is, I'm not sure you're asking that, uh, would he actually be nominated and would he be uh, elected? Uh, so let's start with that. Would he have been nominated and elected if he'd served? Yeah, well, I like, I like to believe that. Um, but anyway, there, there's, a pro, there, there's a reasonable uh, basis for, for saying that. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, what he would do now, some of it is uh, because he's, he's the president's brother. Uh, and, and uh, the, you know, all the stories which are true about Il Indiana uh, in, in the presidential in 1968, in the, in the primary, uh, he could get people who on both black and white, uh, and that did happen. Uh, is it something that could be done in another place? I think so, but I don't know. But that definitely happened uh, in Gary, Indiana and, and other places in, in Indiana. So we like to believe that he, and he certainly would try to make, bring people together. No question about that. Uh, now, he's not here. That's one, but two, he's not here. We're here. And whoever is here has the responsibility, all of us to do that. Uh, it's just very, uh, you don't get uh, somebody who has uh, leadership of that. Uh, you know, I like to think that Obama, uh, had he been able to, he only really had uh, the first uh, two years of his being president, and then he didn't have the capacity to get these kinds of things done. But um, the difference between saying this is what we ought to do uh, and the unusual person. And I, I actually insist that if we don't have that, uh, it's our responsibility to do it. Uh, but in terms of, of specifically here, uh, let's just hope we grow. I mean, we have the possibility after this Tuesday, we have an opportunity. That's what I wanna say. If the things happen on Tuesday, it is our opportunity. This is an enormous opportunity for this country, starting Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever that is, Thursday, um, because it's on us. And we have the capacity to do that. Not the particular person necessarily, but maybe they're out there. We don't know and they'll, they'll, they will come ahead. But we, we've got a better opportunity than we've had for a very, very long time. So what would you put at the top of, if it's President Biden, what would be the top of the agenda? 
Well, around, I mentioned, I'll say it again, it's, it's worth saying twice, uh, in terms of, of low income, I'm talking, I'm not, I'm not talking about the environment and other things that are extremely important. That's, that's another list, which is, uh, we, we would have to figure that all, all of the priorities uh, together. But, but I think the things I, I said are, are doable which would make a difference to get started. I also want to do what I just went through about starting the, the things that will happen over a period of time. We can do to fix uh, healthcare uh, right away. Uh, and uh, we can do the 15% uh, minimum, uh, 15, $15 uh, an hour. Uh, the, 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 the bills to do these things on child care, child uh, development, that's out there. Um, they're all, they've, they're all, they've all been introduced. Uh, and the question of, of, of cash assistance uh, at the bottom, and there's litigation, uh, legislation on that, that there have uh, the, the, essentially the child tax credit uh, it's called American Family Act. Um, you can get, uh, it's all written. There's about 140 uh, in the House, uh, set 170 and 40 uh, senators have already signed on it. It can be done. And if you did just that bill, it would raise, uh, it would end 38% of the, of the poverty of, of kids. 38% would be done just with that one bill. Wow, remarkable. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that just came in is, what tax rate uh, would we need to, to do all of this? What would you be comfortable with? Well, uh, just basically, uh, we, we've had this time with the awful time, the, the COVID, uh, and quite rightly, we, we've spent a, an enormous amount of money for that, and we should be continuing. And that we haven't, it's it's uh, unfortunate. Uh, so yes, there's a uh, you don't just say I've got all this stuff I want to do. The um, you, there's a lot of money out there on the top, a lot of it, uh, and uh, whether that will do the whole amount. Uh, we'll see, uh, but uh, there's no. There, I I don't have a magic amount of money uh, that that you don't or they or the student had. Uh, but yeah, you you can't just say uh, doesn't matter. There's a, on you know whatever you want to write. That's that's not right. So, uh, but I will say there's a lot of money out there. And you know, I think one of the you know, I, again, we were talking before in the as we were preparing. Uh, when you wrote "So Rich, So Poor," uh, you know, one of the points that you make, which was really very powerful, is the way in which, from essentially from 1870 to 1972, wealth disparity in this country shrank, and then from 1972, it's exploded again. And in the decades since you wrote that book, it's increased even more. Um, so that that's consistent with. I think what you're suggesting now with respect to the tax rates. Yes, I mean, it's, it's the, whole, the whole issue is, do we have the political strength? The whole thing. And, and uh, if we had the success on, on, on Tuesday, that tells you at least considerable amount of the fact that we can go forward and do a lot. Um, exactly how much? Well, you know, we're also not crazy. But, but there's money out there. But you're not going to get it if you don't have the votes. Right. So let me go back the an earlier point in which there was tremendous optimism about the possibility of a progressive agenda was the start of President Clinton's uh, administration, uh, which you write about. Um, I'd like to focus on the resignation uh, now. Uh, you know, and I think resignation is not something that we do very much in America. You know, I mean, I think you and, and Cy Vance uh, during President Carter's administration are the two examples that people point to. Uh, so that was a very, that was a big decision. Um, so uh, student rights, was your decision based on logic and reason or was it a gut reaction? <laughs> Both. Uh, I, uh, well, uh, 
the the we I actually kind of silly on my part uh, thought uh, through uh, 1996 that he wouldn't do it. This is I'm talking about the welfare law. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I had conversations with people in HHS where I was and and uh, uh, there was uh, one one uh, friend uh, and who was my my uh, uh, d number two uh, said, "Don't kid yourself." That that's to say, uh, when he said on the day that uh, he decided that he is going to uh, sign the bill, uh, I was kind of kind of surprised. I mean, I, I wasn't shocked uh, because he had been playing around with it and, and had, the signals were not good. Um, so I didn't have, uh, my friend Wendell uh, said to me, uh, if he says uh, that, um, uh, that, that he's gonna sign it, he said, I'm gonna be out there the next day. Um, and uh, it, it took me a little bit while to, to get my together. So uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of an instinct, uh, but also um, that was just wrong. And I add, the one thing I did was I asked the people who worked with me uh, and I felt like I had to be with them and they said, these are career people, uh, and uh, they said, okay, Peter, uh, we'll, we'll do what we have to do inside, you go outside. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, and I, I didn't go until uh, after November because it, it had the, uh, I, I did want uh, Clinton to be president and Bob Dole, who wasn't a horrible man, I didn't want Bob Hold, Dole to be uh, president. So I didn't say anything uh, other than a very short statement uh, until after that. And then I found myself going all over the country and people would come up to me, uh, to have, you know, I was asked for, for speech and, and so on and so on. And they would say, thank you. Uh, you know, I finally had a kind of a small joke that, that the only thing I ever did was to, was to quit a job. Um, and uh, so I found out after the fact, how important it was to have done it. And would you encourage people uh, in similar situations to resign? Yes, no. I mean, uh, should you? It's all individual. But uh, if if there's something um, in a, in a an administration, there's always something that you don't agree with. Uh, and so you can't go around, and it's on the other side of the town. It's in a different. It's another department. It's you're you're nothing to do with it. You just think it's wrong. That doesn't seem seem to me. I mean, you can quit, but uh, even that, it's questionable whether you really should have. If your problem that you're working on, you're working on it in the way it's supposed to be. So there's got to be a connection. I had the responsibility uh, with a, with uh, a one other person uh, in the department, or or two others, and and uh, that we had the responsibility for that. So I think that's important. Um, and and uh, but then um, the other side of it is it, uh, it, 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 if you can't the, you you really have a deep uh, disagreement i i think it's appropriate to quit well i mean in your case it really made a powerful statement it turns out it was uh and and uh i was uh i don't want to say i was pleased because i it's terrible um but the fact that it made some difference i didn't i didn't understand how uh, widely uh, around the country who thought that there was uh, basically nobody uh, in Washington who understood the significance of this.
uh, and and I and the other other two uh, were sending a message that we yes we understand what this is and it turned out uh, just a sense of of uh, there's some sanity mm -hmm. in Washington some yeah it was, I mean it's very powerful um, and we're we're drawing to a close so there are a number of questions that students have that are really mm -hmm. nice questions. So we're kind of, so let me read some of them. We'll see. Um, sure. First, um, one student writes, um, Peter, um, they write, how did you and, and Marion Wright Edelman, your mm -hmm. wife, balance your professional aspirations, civic duties and family life? And do you have any advice for law students who might be worried about balancing their career with their personal lives? Not deeply knowledgeable. Uh, except there are people uh, who are there today uh, and uh, those of us who have uh, children, uh, depends on the age a little bit, uh, and we both have jobs, uh, which both, if that's what we do, we should. Um, and it's very tough to do it. Uh, I think I think the best thing to say is you're not alone, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, th this is not easy to handle all of those things. And and you know my hat goes off to everybody. Uh, you know we to honestly uh, we had Ms. Amy, and Ms. Amy was from m my wife's uh, town in South in South Carolina, and that was our secret. Uh, I mean, it's not a secret. I'll tell you, but but um, that that we could that that made it easier because she was absolutely one hundred one thousand uh, person lived with us, uh, knew Marion since she was a baby, uh, and uh, she was just a miracle. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that takes away my being a much much advice to anybody else. It, it's it, it's very very difficult. I mean, I think you know one thing that um, I think it's very powerful for students is you know to hear to acknowledge that it's a challenge. Um, so thank you. Um, another another student writes, quoting from your book. Uh, you write, the very fact that there are people who care so much and who are determined to make things happen, there are even people who run for office, should be an inspiration that gives us a renewal of hope. So the question is, how do students find these people and cultivate mentorships with them, particularly in our virtual environment? I think in terms of our um, faculty, we have a remarkable group of people. And I think there are people speaking kind of generally that some students feel, how can I do that? How can I go talk to my professor about uh, whatever it is, not, not just maybe not, but beyond a case that to, to, to understand what it means. Um, the, the door is open. Uh, every place, every every person in our faculty uh, is is ready, and um, so I think that that's uh, now in, in terms of the public interest, uh, everybody believes that in in, in general. But uh, one of the strengths of of our faculty and any good faculty is that we have different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, everybody's responsible, um, and uh, but if you want to dig in um, more on the specifics of public interest work, uh, that isn't everybody um, for that specific thing. But that's a big lot of people, uh, and and we have every kind of uh, intellectual uh, areas. Uh, to make it a, a, th a three-dimensional place. Uh, and, and there are people who will be uh, helpful to places specifically about uh, public interest kinds of things. I'll bet you that uh, 
some of you uh, haven't take the possibility of, of having that conversation. If you all have, wonderful. Then let's go, you know, let's find out uh, one of the reasons why I have a field placement uh, seminar uh, and there are lots and lots of other ways to do it, you know, uh, outside of the building. And, and again, uh, you got you got to get off your walk out to uh, find those people, uh, both to understand about the work that they do and that you even get a chance to do some of that, but also people who give you uh, some background and advice uh, in those places. And uh, so all of that is kind of your responsibility. There's a lot of people to talk to. And any one person you talk to uh, can give you five more. I think you know one of the things that for me was a takeaway from your book is you're talking about the people who your mentors who had such influence on you. Um, so Justice Goldberg, uh, you'd also talked about Assistant Attorney General Douglas, Senator Kennedy, um, and you you know and I think you've really made an uh, an effort to do that at the law school both personally and then. You know the the field placements. I think that's a that's great advice. Um, and you know, I, I, to go back to another point that you said, you know, we have faculty members who are totally different in terms of what they're interested in. But part of this, you know, what you're I think calling on people is to think about you know who has a background that they're interested in exploring. Um, and you know, we have many faculty who would love to talk about you know possible career paths. So that's terrific advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so another, um, this is another work-life balance, a little different than the one before. Um, throughout the book, you discuss Senator Kennedy's ability to deeply connect with individuals. How do you think he balanced his immense workload and being in the moment with each person? Uh, he just loved that. Uh, and and it was uh, low income people. Uh, it it was it, it is he, he was uh, just interested in everybody. Uh, and uh, so he's also interested. Uh, two of the great poets, the Russian poets uh, uh, of uh, a couple of decades back, and got to know the the two of them. And, and uh, he had a, he had from his father he had a relationship uh, uh, with President Hoover uh, and, and and General MacArthur because he had this and, and he didn't disagree he didn't agree with them um, but he learned from that and he and he listened uh, and uh, he just loved uh, to interesting people. And I saw, I mean, I saw it happen. I, I saw it with my wife um, because uh, he met, uh, she met, he, he, uh, her uh, at, the, at, at a time when I, I was there and, and uh, she just, he, he had an instinct um, that these are, I mean, Cesar Chavez, um, I had the possibility that, that I was there with them and watch that. Uh, they came to a parking place outside of the place where the hearing had been. Uh, and uh, they, they just started talking to each other uh, in, in, in this parking lot. And it was a real scene because you had uh, circle, 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 circle. They couldn't hear the people, but th they knew there was something going on there. And from that, they were just close friends. Uh, 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 until he died, so he just had a he just had a particular sense of of people who were very special, uh, and he he understood he just got it, uh, and I watched some of it that was just wonderful. But he also, um, I think he also just was interested in people. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, yeah. I was um, I worked at the Department of Justice in the late nineties. Uh, and I heard from so many of the senior attorneys about when he was attorney general and he would come by people's offices and yes. the door would be open. And then the attorney general would come in and ask them what they were working on. Yes, true, true, true. Yes. And, uh, 
you know, and so, I mean, this was 35 years afterwards. Then they all remember. They all remember. Yeah, no, that, remember. absolutely. So, so uh, because, so it's on a couple of levels here. One, one is he just likes everybody, except that, you know, who we don't. Um, and, uh, which is right too. Uh, and the other is uh, this other level of, of the people who was a smaller group where he just gets this in instinct that this extra person, uh, and they're both there, they're both there. And so when he met Marion, um, he, he got it. And of course, who wouldn't, but uh, yeah, it's, so it's both those things go. So let me go to the final student question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you write about your time working for RFK, I'm quoting, like many who experienced so much so quickly in the 60s, you write, I was not the same person at age 30 that I had been at 25. I had been shaped by witnessing injustice in the company of a man who constantly sought it out and tried to write it. The student asks, I believe many of us are having similar awakenings as we experience, quote, so much so quickly, unquote, in recent months, how do you recommend staying grounded and guarded against cynicism when the world feels like it's turning upside down? You're not allowed to. I mean, if, if you uh, care about all this, which we do, um, you can't walk away with it. It, things are going in the, the wrong direction. You can't walk away. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's going to be, it has been for the last four years. Um, but anytime when um, people say, uh, I'm not going to try anymore, that's horrible. So, uh, as difficult as it might is, and, and I don't want to be, you know, it's very, uh, this is an awful time, but there's really only one choice, which is forward, is to, or, or push back against them. Um, and uh, anybody who thinks they can walk away, it's not my person. And then, you know, that's, you know, that's so powerful in your book, uh, you know, Senator Kennedy's assassination, uh, you know, the, the Welfare Reform Act signing, you know, that, that, you know, yours is a story where you're confronting um, different kinds of losses, but losses. Uh, and yet you really have fought throughout your career. Uh, and that, I mean, I have to say, that's a very inspiring, uh, motto, you know, for us to keep in mind. Um, is there a final thought that you'd like to leave us with as we as we draw the session to a close? But I, I just have to say, you know, I, um, you have been a source of inspiration for me throughout my career. And it's a privilege to be your colleague. And it's a privilege to have this conversation today. So well, thank you very much. It's those kind words. Um, you know, I do what I do because I do it. Um, and I think that's the, the point is uh, not to me, although one should have, uh, wanna do work that you wanna do, uh, but um, it is about the work and to make a difference, to make a difference as Robert Kennedy used to say all the time. Um, so I think that's what I would ask people to do. Uh, and in so many different ways, you can do it. Part of it's your job uh, that you have, uh, but maybe it's, it's uh, something that you're in a law firm in uh, pro bono. Uh, I just wanna say to everybody here who's thinking uh, about working in a law firm, uh, just do the pro bono the maximum that they will let you do. Uh, and indeed, find the firm before you go. Uh, most firms uh, do uh, allow, allow that uh, because there's so much you can do from any base. 
Um, and I mean, look, look what's happening uh, now uh, with eviction uh, that's going to come out here soon because of COVID um, very shortly all over the country and here in, in DC. Uh, and every lawyer who, or in some other way perhaps, but as a lawyer uh, to learn how to do that, and it doesn't matter what kind of a lawyer you are because you could learn how to do that. I've heard over and over again for lawyers who say, I'm scared to do that. And this is some big time lawyer. And oh, I don't know how to do that in, in, the, uh, in that court. Uh, so whatever people are going to do, whether it's their full-time job or, or it's, it's, it's fr from uh, what they're doing uh, most of the time in a law firm, um, you got to get in there and, and do as much as you can for low-income people. Um, they need them. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, you are, you're an inspiration uh, and you know, at a very difficult time, uh, I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk to you and and to get your thoughts on what we should do moving forward. So thank you for a great conversation. Um, and to our students, uh, I will see you in two weeks. Um, take care, stay well, and if you haven't already, please vote. So thank you very much for an inspiring path forward. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Take care all.